Very exciting. Thanks, Dan, for letting me ring the gong. Um, good afternoon, um, and welcome to Startups at the City Club. Uh, my name is Michael Goldberg. I'm a visiting assistant professor at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University, uh, and also run a small venture capital fund here in Cleveland. Um, our program this afternoon is part of a series of gatherings and conversations hosted by the St Cleveland Startup Collective and the City Club to drive discussion around sustaining and nurturing entrepreneurial activity here in Greater wow. Cleveland. Um, today, we are uh, talking specifically about creating and growing startup communities in places that aren't uh, next, to the or next to Silicon Valley or in San Francisco. And we're doing it here at the City Club around the world with those of you who are joining via WebEx um, in the US, and, and we have a number of folks who are outside the US joining us as well. Uh, I'm really pleased to be uh, part of this event today. I'm actually, on April 28th, I'm launching um, what's called a MOOC, a massive open online course. It'll be on Coursera, and the topic of that MOOC is, I'm calling it Beyond Silicon Valley, uh, Growing Entrepreneurship in Transitioning Economies, where I'm taking a look at what we've done here in Northeast Ohio and comparing and contrasting to other markets. So it's free to sign up, so please, uh, please join. We have about 5,000 people from around the world that have signed up so far. Um, our goal today is straightforward. We're going to hear stories from four startup communities and begin to put those experiences in conversation with one another. The best case scenario, at the end of this hour, we'll have a better understanding of the elements that are crucial in creating successful entrepreneurial communities. And worst case, we'll all understand that we're not alone and at least have some good ideas to import. Let me introduce you to our panelists, and let me start with the ones that are furthest away joining us remotely via WebEx. Uh, on the West Coast in Los Angeles, Jim Andelman is the co-founder and managing partner of Rincon Venture Partners. He's been involved in venture capital investing for 14 years and serves on a slew of corporate and nonprofit boards. Hi, Jim. Hi there. Thanks for joining. Uh, next up in the mountain time zone, Boulder, Colorado, is Brad Feld. Uh, Brad is the author of Startup Communities, Building an Entrepreneurial Ecosystem in Your Community, and also Venture Deals. Be smarter than your lawyer and venture capitalist. Brad, you'll be happy to know I just used your book in my class right before I came over here today at Weatherhead. Um, Brad's a founder a few times over and is currently a venture capitalist with the Foundry Group and also helped found Techstars, an innovative seed accelerator network. Hi, Brad. Okay, there's Brad's computer. Okay, we'll come back to Brad. Um, so live with me here at the City Club, uh, but from Kansas City is Matthew Marcus. Matthew's an entrepreneur. His company, Hoopla, offers event marketing solutions, and he's also a leader among many in Kansas City's Startup Village. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, our, our hometown boy on the panel from Cleveland is Lev Gonick, a former colleague of mine at Case Western, and he's uh, one of the founders and current CEO at One Community, Northeast Ohio's uh, public benefit broadband provider. Um, and they've been doing Fiverr for people and institutions that they serve for 10 years. Uh, so we'll do 30 minutes kind of talking with the panel, and then we'll be opening it up to questions both from folks here and then on the WebEx. Um, let me just start off, Jim, maybe you can start, um, if you can just sort of give me a thumbnail sketch, the thumbnail sketch of the important things we should understand about the startup community where you operate. Uh, sure, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Jim and the Rincon Venture Partners, um, I, uh, Founded Rincon about seven years ago, and we are a pretty tightly focused venture firm with an emphasis on our home market of Southern California. Uh, I moved here from San Francisco, where I led software investing for a two hundred fifty million dollar fund up there. So I am uh, am quite aware of the contracts. Um, you know, LA is an interesting market. It's the second largest EMA after New York. Uh, there's a you know tremendous upswell in entrepreneurial activity. But uh, relative to the scale of the of the, the market and that activity, there's sort of a, a, a severe shortage of capital. So that's always been the, the complaint and the challenge in this market. Uh, uh, number one, which is a lack of startup capital. Uh, the second is sort of just the the fundamental nature of the business um, community here. Uh, it may be less uh, startup and capital appreciation oriented and a little more uh, mature cash flow oriented. Um, and, uh, but but there have been uh, you know, tremendous strides in the last, uh, in the last number of years since, uh, since I started in, in Southern California. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Brad, are you there? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll start that. Brad, can you hear us? Yeah. 
Okay, we'll skip Brad for a second. Matthew, maybe you can uh, give us the, a little thumbnail of Kansas City. Sure. Um, so I'm here representing myself as an entrepreneur and also as a community builder. Um, I represent the, the Kansas City Startup Village, which uh, it's important to know that that's just a component of the overall Kansas City ecosystem. Um, but the great thing about Kansas City is over the last three, four years, it's seen an accelerated um, ramp up or growth uh, and excitement around entrepreneurialism and, uh, and startup activities. So uh, the great thing about it is, you know, pointing to Brad's book, is all the components, all the sectors and the support groups that need to come into play are coming into play. And uh, because of that, Kansas City seen a, a lot of a lot of growth, uh, including the startup village, which I hope to talk about soon. Great, uh, Lev. Well, I, it would be presumptuous for me to try to describe to this audience uh, something about uh, the the Cleveland uh, startup scene. Uh, you are well represented uh, here in the room. I will just speak ever so briefly about the role that one community uh, has played and uh, would like to continue playing. A decade ago, we began building out an infrastructure, thinking of it very much as a petri dish. Petri dish for innovation, a petri dish for uh, thinking about how next generation networks could help catalyze uh, innovation and creativity. Uh, we focused in where it made sense because building this infrastructure is not like putting a petri dish in your kitchen or even if it were two girls in a garage trying to create the new startup venture. Uh, the infrastructure that we built is actually fiber optic infrastructure and we knew it was going to be a decade-long journey. Uh, we've grown into a $100 million investment that we've made as a community, that it says our nonprofit organization has. Uh, we have actually, over that period of time, brought on over 800 organizations to our network infrastructure, uh, using it, um, all of our healthcare assets in the region are, are on the network, most of our education, lots of our uh, museums, libraries, and government facilities are on the network. Um, as I joined the organization, in July, uh, as the new chief executive, I started reaching out to a number of you here in the audience and asked what next could we do. And so I want to start not only by describing what we've done, but I want to start with an announcement right here, right now. And that is working with a lot of folks here in the room, uh, one community will actually be launching a broadband innovation fund so that in fact, a seven figure fund that will actually allow us to support the entrepreneurs across the region who are interested in a startup activity, who are looking for that startup capital, uh, who have an idea that's related to the use of network infrastructure to create the next great good and service. Great. Thank you. Hey, Brad, are you connected? Brad, can you hear me? Okay. Hold on. Uh, can great. Voice conference. Okay. Is Brad? Let me yeah. uh, let me jump. Is oh, is Brad on? Can you hear me? Our speaker's turned up, and our speaker is turned up, and it's really okay. Either, uh, he can. Uh, and our microphone's turned We can on, hear Brad. Okay. Maybe just Dirk. Maybe just ask Brad to start. Yeah, just to tell. Ask Brad to just give a quick overview of the startup community in Boulder. He's gone. All right. <laughs> there we go. That's that was very, it, was. It, was very, it was very quick. Yeah. Um, Jim, if you're Jim, are you still there? Yeah. Jim, let me let me ask you a question. I mean, you talked about the lack of um, one of the challenges in LA being the lack of available um, investment capital. It's something that here in Cleveland, um, in Northeast Ohio, we've uh, struggled with as well. Um, here we've um, and we'll get to sort of the role of philanthropy, but government through the Third Frontier Program, which is a 2.3 billion dollar. Um, state program around commercialization has provided a number, a lot of funding opportunities that eventually get to entrepreneurs. Have you seen anything, being a private return on investment oriented investor, have you seen um, local efforts to help um, bridge that capital gap um, from government in, in the Los Angeles area? Uh, to be honest, not a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, LA is Los Angeles and, and greater Los Angeles County is, is, a, is a big place that has, uh, and city officials and, and local government have a lot of issues on the mind. Uh, this is one of them, and, and actually Los Angeles has a, has a new mayor named Eric Garcetti who is uh, quite sympathetic to our cause. Uh, that said, it seems that there have been lots of other priorities that have uh, uh, ended up higher on the list than supporting startups. 
Um, it is one of those things that, uh, well, I actually will give an example. There was a north of LA, uh, Ventura County, and the city of Ventura um, has incubator space, opened up incubator space that is literally connected to City Hall uh, and is subsidized rent and does shine a light on those businesses. And the city pension system did. Uh, put some, uh, make some capital commitments to some VC funds who agreed to, on a best effort basis, deploy that capital within the city limits. So I think that's a pretty darn good model. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, Los Angeles and Santa Monica and the, and the surrounding um, uh, uh, municipalities will do similar. There is, a, there is an awful lot of money in the pension systems in, in Southern California. And to date, there has not been an emphasis or a focus or a deliberate orientation for deploying that capital in a manner that uh, supports uh, its own existence. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, another key part of the um, equation in supporting entrepreneurship here in Northeast Ohio has been the, the philanthropy and foundations. And Matthew, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the role. I mean, Kansas City is home to Kaufman. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you can talk about the role that philanthropy has played in supporting um, your efforts around entrepreneurship in Kansas City. Yeah, I, I mean, you nailed it right there. It's the Kauffman Foundation, you know, the, the wealthiest foundation dedicated towards the advancement of entrepreneurship. And to have them in our backyard is, is something we certainly don't take for granted. Um, what's interesting about the foundation is I think maybe three or four years ago, they were doing more on a national slash international level <clears throat> and not really focusing on what was happening in their own backyard until we jumped up and down and said, hey, what about us? And they've implemented a really interesting program. Uh, they're not allowed because they're a nonprofit to fund startups or even to, uh, you know, give money to fund startups. Uh, but what they can do is provide resources and education and programming. And one of the most successful programs I think that they've released over the last couple of years is One Million Cups, uh, which started in Kansas City and has now expanded to 23 or 24 different cities. And the premise is really simple. Um, get entrepreneurs, get the community together on a weekly basis for an hour, and basically two startups present to their fellow entrepreneurs uh, each week. They get six minutes to present their startup, and then there's a period of 20 minutes of Q&A and then some announcements, networking before and networking after. The concept's really simple, um, but the impact has been immeasurable, and so much so that they've taken it to other cities. So, you know, again, it's great having them in our backyard and these type of programs and the founder school and everything else that they do is, um, is fantastic. Right. Lev, you um, came from one of our anchor institutions, spent a lot of time um, before your um, work at One Community. And at One Community, you're working closely with a lot of our anchors. Can you talk about the importance of, of leveraging anchor institutions in the support of entrepreneurship here? Sure. Well, it seems to me that uh, you know we're really talking about the layers uh, of support that a community can provide. You've obviously got the formal state level investment. You've got private philanthropy. You've got philanthropy, community philanthropy. Uh, and it seems to me that all of the anchor institutions uh, in our community uh, have a mission-related component to their core work. Uh, it's typically in the higher education called service. Uh, but uh, in truth, it's always about creating a relationship between the priorities of the anchor institution and the pri priorities of the community. And too often from anchor institutions, historically, it's been an either or statement. Either we attend to the priorities of the anchor institution or we quote unquote get uh, mission creep and we start dealing with uh, the community or others. Uh, I think what's happened uh, certainly uh, in the last decade at Case Western Reserve as one institution in the town is that there's been a much more, uh, if you will, uh, a focused commitment to actually bringing together and creating an and both statement rather than an either or st statement around that. And actually my own organization is a spin-off of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, we're realizing that network futures was not just something that should be happening on a college campus, but really if it was going to be successful, it really had to actually uh, embrace and support the entire community. Um, and I think that that's kind of one example of, of the role of, a, of the uh, anchor institution. But just to go on very briefly to name some other activities, you know, Case Western Reserve has had and now again will have 
uh, an investment fund for, uh, for startup activities, uh, both within the institution as well as being able to partner with others who've got startup capital uh, ready to put into play. There's all kinds of important uh, back office services and supports, uh, business, uh, business plan uh, development, uh, legal uh, uh, support that can be done both from uh, the formal institution as well as making it a practicum for law school students. Um, there's all kinds of that uh, opportunity to take a great university who filled with young people interested in having practical experiences to tie to their classroom work and giving them a chance both to take their own ideas into play but also being part of the broader ecosystem. And I think Case Western Reserve University does it just about as well as I've seen anywhere in the country. Great. Um, is Brad on? Brad, welcome. Thanks. Can you hear me? We can. We can. We can. Hey! Um, <laughs> So let me jump right into it. Thanks for thanks for taking the time to be with us. Um, sure. You know, you you um, both in startup communities and some of the blog posts that you've <laughs> you've uh, put out have, I would say, kind of have a healthy skepticism of the role of government in supporting entrepreneurship. Um, in the room today, I know we have a couple of our seed accelerators um, that have benefited from a government program where the twenty five thousand dollar investment in in their companies is sort of through government money sort of channeled through our nonprofit accelerators. Maybe you can talk about your experience and why um, you have this, uh, again, maybe what I call, might call sort of a healthy skepticism of, uh, of the role of government in supporting entrepreneurship. Sure, uh, I, I think it comes to a couple of things. And to be clear, it's not that government can't support the role of entrepreneurship or help entrepreneurship is that government often puts itself in a position where it tries to control what's going on. Um, in, in startup communities, in the way that I talk about the evolution and growth of startup communities, I separate all the constituencies into two categories, uh, leaders and feeders. Um, the leaders have to be entrepreneurs. The feeders are everyone else, which includes government, includes university, includes service providers, includes investors, venture capitalists, et cetera. And the fundamental challenge often with government is the government puts itself in a position where it tries to control what's going on, or it tries to lead what's happening. And in the absence of the entrepreneur being the leader, you just make leaders, you make no progress. That's piece one. Piece two is that government functions on a relatively short time cycle, right? Most government is focused on an annual cycle. Elections happen every two years. Most administrations turn over, you know, within two, four, six, eight year time period. Building a sustainable startup community takes 20 years. So the challenge of government is it's on a much shorter time cycle than it actually is required. So government in the context of being a, playing a support role, playing a feeder role, and you know we can go into if you want some of the the things that it can do that are actually productive is very valuable but when you get stuck in this cycle where everybody's looking to government to lead or to set the agenda or to drive or when government officials try to do that you end up having the startup community activity stall great thanks brad um jim maybe you can talk for a second about um the angel community out in la um, we probably in Northeast Ohio, we went from 10 years ago not having a lot of angel activity here. And again, some of this was spurred through um, some state programs in terms of tax credits and matching funding. And we have a little bit more angel activity than we had certainly 10 years ago. Maybe you can give us a sense of what's happening in LA and how you've encouraged private um, individuals to back local startup companies. Sure. I mean, I think that you know, the very best angel well it's context you know i do uh internet investing i invest in software to service and online marketing technology so that is the universe around which i feel qualified to discuss <laughs> there's lots of other good ways to make money that's the way i think i know how. um so within that domain i think the very best angel investors uh, for companies like that are folks who've had success and made money in those sectors uh, and, you know, that, there is a chicken-egg challenge there. Um, in Los Angeles, it, is, it has been happening over the last 10 years or so as there have been successful outcomes and wealth creation. Uh, and then the, sort of the, the money that comes along uh, with the mentorship that successful Internet operators will provide. Uh, I would say certainly on an upswing, 
uh, and there is more angel and you know what I would call institutional seed money available in LA than ever before. Uh, it still pales in comparison to the uh, demand side, if you will. Uh, we're seeing you know a tremendous rate of, of new company formation. Uh, there are, uh, I think, sort of inspired by um, the tech stars more than any other organization. Uh, there are a there's a healthy crop of accelerator programs here in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, there is still a funding gap. So you know the, the uh, a number of the accelerator programs have done sort of angel investment boot camp, uh, and I think that's a great place to start. That's a great contributor. And the question is, how do you get people with money comfortable and paying attention, uh, and and willing to make those sort of leaps of faith with their dollars? Um, and you know, it's again, I, as to echo Brad's comment, it's not an overnight thing. It's going to be a process. It's going to take a while. I think a lot of angels um, don't realize the time frames involved here, how long your money is going to be liquid, how long it's going to take for an individual investment you make to, uh, uh, to turn back into money. Uh, and therefore, I think the activity comes in waves where uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm, people put a bunch of money to work, and then they realize they needed to reserve some for follow on they weren't expecting to, uh, and then individuals retract. Uh, and then that cycle happens over and over again over a couple of weeks. Um, I do think institutional seed funds and early stage investors, so long as they can stay funded and in business, you know, are more predictable sources of that kind of capital. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, you know, I want to turn and then I want to open it up to questions just to sort of this question of measuring success. I mean, Matthew, from your perspective um, and the efforts that you guys have in Kansas City, what does success look like? Um, I will answer that coming from the startup village perspective okay. because that's really where I put most of my efforts. Um, success for us right now is growing our density, uh, growing those um, collisions and collaborations uh, and knowledge sharing. So the interesting thing about the village is that it's, we like to dub it as a living incubator, right? Because there's these great accelerator programs, there's these great incubator programs, but only a few companies ever get into them, right? You have to apply, you have to get accepted into them. For the rest of the entrepreneurs, it's, you're left to figure it out on your own. And the worst thing you can do is huddle up in your basement or your garage or your spare bedroom because entrepreneurship can be a lonely road. And what you don't know, you don't know. So for success for us is really continuing our growth, continuing to get more startups to relocate and, um, and, and create jobs. Um, and, and get a successful exit, actually, out of, out of the village. Um, we've got a lot of great startups in there, and I think when we have that one that gets acquired or maybe IPOs, who knows, um, it'll really help put us uh, you know, on the map. That's a great question. I mean, love it's, I mean you, you know the community here, and we have some great examples sort of over our 10 years of great growing success, but we don't have the WhatsApp. We don't have the Groupon. I mean, how do you think it's the same as we think about measuring success in Cleveland? Um, do we need that exit? Uh, actually, I, I don't think about the exit conversation. There are others whose money is on the table, and so they may be thinking a lot more about it than, than, than I do. But um, you know, my view is that we're kind of in a pre-takeoff pre period in our community. For all the work that's gone on, and for all of the cycles that have been spent in the last number of decades, certainly in the last decade, uh, we're still early on in terms of the ingredients that it takes to sustain. Uh, a vibrant uh, effort. Uh, we need to have, in my view, 10 uh, Shaker Heights fiberhood initiatives connecting fiber infrastructure to communities where people live um, all over our region. Uh, we need to support lots, lots of strategies that are at the high school and at the college level uh, activity set. It's still foreign to our culture uh, as a, essentially a 20th century, you know, steel town uh, still trying to reinvent itself and so we need to have lots of opportunity for more failure along the journey before we start saying all we need is a silver bullet and it's called an exit yes we need exits to be sure but that's not going to change the culture in and of itself yeah great um, and then Brad let me ask you the to maybe comment on the same thing I mean you alluded to it in your um, statement and certainly in your book you talk about these sort of 20-year cycles Silicon Valley wasn't built overnight um, how do you um, when you talk to people around the world about kind of this journey, how do you um, keep, tell people to sort of remain patient and th that 
you know, the 20 years that it could take a while for these good things to happen? Yeah, two things. One is, and I, thought, I think the last two things that were said, or last three things that were said, going back to Jim's comment about what's going on in LA are right on the money. Um, everybody likes to talk about how much progress we've made. Uh, and I'll give an example. I was in Boise uh, four or five years ago, and then I was in Boise again two years ago. And I gave a talk you know, to the annual entrepreneurship awards dinner thing and somebody asked me the question you know hey you were here two years ago how much progress did we make and i said it doesn't matter you know check back in in 20 years and in fact you know i've lived in boulder since 1995 so i've now been here almost 18 years i'm 18 years into a 38 year journey you have to constantly be looking forward and this this statement that there's no silver bullet in some ways, a disproportionate outside exit early in the cycle isn't actually that healthy, right? It's good, it's fine, but it's not what you're striving for. What you're striving for is building over a long period of time steady and continual progress and success and a culture change around entrepreneurship. And when you think about how long it takes to build a successful company, Sure, you see, and you can read in TechCrunch, or you can read about these great stories of companies that were overnight successes in two or three years. You know, that's that's 0.01%, 0.001%. The vast majority of successful startups, including, by the way, successful tech companies, you know, they 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 start to find their way in year five. They might hit their stride in year ten. 15, 20 years later, they, they're really substantial businesses. So you should be thinking about it as the same way you start the company. It's not that you're successful overnight. It's that great companies take 10, 20 years to build to get to the place where they start to be recognized as great companies. So the same thing is true for your city. Don't worry about we're in year three or we're in year seven or we're even in year 10. Just keep looking forward 20 years keep building systematically around entrepreneurship. Last comment I'd make, which Jim said, and I think it's really, really true. Every city that I talk to, every city I've been part of has angel investors. They're called rich people. And when people bitch, people bitch about how there's not enough capital, the, the source of capital that you can help in your local city is to teach and encourage wealthy people who want to reinvest in the community take a portion of the money that they're reinvesting philanthropically and allocate it to investing in startups and new companies and innovation, which by the way, is an investment that in some cases returns zero dollars, but lots of qualitative benefits, but in other cases returns meaningful dollars. To put a point on that, my most successful angel investment was one that I made in 1994, and I just got the last check for it a month ago. And, you know, that was an angel investment of mine that on a cash on cash basis probably returned about 300 times my money. Okay, I can have 299 other angel investments return zero and I broke even. <laughs> so it, it's this idea of playing a long game, doing it over a long period of time, being consistent and putting your money back into the ecosystem, especially as an entrepreneur that generated the wealth for you, or if you know, you're a, a father of the city or a founding father of the city or a founding mother of the city or someone who's you know, a wealthy part of the city, in addition to contributing to all the infrastructure in the city, contribute to the next generation of entrepreneurial talent. And over time, those companies will attract venture investment those companies will have exits and those entrepreneurs will reinvest back in the community. And you'll look back 20 years from now and you'll build something that's sustainable. Great, thanks Brad. Um, let's open it up to questions. I think what we're gonna do is we have a number of folks tuning in from overseas and in the US on the WebEx. We're gonna go first to uh, a WebEx question from, is it Alexis in Greece? In Athens, Greece. Alexis, are you there? Mike, I can hear you. Okay, great. Go ahead. You're live in Cleveland. 
Thank you so much for the discussion up to now. It's been, it's been really great to hear what's happening in the States. And we also need to see here in Greece what we can learn from what you are doing. And this is also what we'll be doing together, Michael, over the next couple of months. I would like to ask a question. I think Lev mentioned um, the change in the university's uh, approach to serving the community, moving from um, an either or situation to an end and weak situation. It is a huge issue with anchor institutions here in Greece, uh, universities that are uh, detached from the community and the financial activity. So I, I would like to, to hear a couple of points how the universities in the States manage to make this transition. Well, I'll, st I'll start uh, to share some of our experience, not only here, if I, will, if I can, I'm gonna try to share some things that are going on around the country as well. And I'm going to focus in on the things that I know best, uh, which happens to deal with broadband. And, and all universities worldwide, uh, we have the luxury of some of the best network connectivity in the world. Uh, the truth of the matter is, universities really did invent the internet. Um, and uh, our ability has really been essentially a very selfish one. That is to say, we continue to innovate. Uh, when I got to Cleveland a decade ago, the big di discussion was, you know, we need to get to a situation where we have you know, 10 times as much bandwidth as we did yesterday. And I said, well, why not just go to 1,000 times? And they said, oh, that's a good question. Let's go to 1,000 times. <laughs> and we just did it. I mean, that was the luxury of being at a university. That's the case in every city in this country where we have major research universities. Uh, 37 of us, including here in Cleveland, 37 research universities three years ago uh, got together and created a consortium called GIGU which is really about extending our gigabit network infrastructure to the communities around us all over the country, uh, which is a, a, an effort by the technology community within the university to uh, seek a way of extending the core competencies of one part of the university uh, community as one example. The, the other activities that I can br briefly point out to are, are really efforts to spin out, effort, spin out IT activities from within the universities. And of course, there are all the ones that we know about famously where we have essentially college dropouts uh, who go on, go on to make bazillions of dollars. Uh, that's really not much of a university partnership. Uh, this has happened to be at the right place at the right time to support dropout activity. Which, <laughs> which somehow, somehow, but there are important things that are going on. One is a kind of intellectual property approach, which some folks may be interested in. Uh, too often universities historically have kind of said anything created on the college campus uh, basically belongs to the university. Turns out that we've been loosening that up so much so that if you're a student today at Stanford, essentially you take all that IP with you. Uh, and it turns out that's really good for the university. Uh, Yahoo has, uh, you know, multiple times paid the, by the tuition that Jerry Yang, uh, you know, had to pay to the university multiple times over by the investments in, in uh, cash and stock uh, that that company, and that can be said for literally hundreds of companies out of that university. We're, we're incentivizing students to innovate. Uh, one of the things that we didn't do very well early on is, we don't want you to play with the network, you could break it. Again, uh, universities are basically saying on the contrary now, we should actually support uh, startup activity within the college environment. I could go on and on, Alexi, but those are some of the things in the IT space that I know well, and then there may be many, many other examples. Great, thanks. Let's take a local, yeah, question, yeah. Great, thanks. So, oh, you're gonna hold it for me. Wow, full service. I have a question for the panel about uh, how, how you think about getting more women entrepreneurs uh, leading companies here. I'm asking uh, for a couple of reasons. Selfishly, I'm a woman CEO, uh, and we always like to see bigger numbers. But strategically for Cleveland, it seems like you could maybe double the chances of having a WhatsApp or a Groupon uh, if, the, if the pool is larger. So the question is really, what have you seen working in other cities, uh, or what have you not seen working yet that, uh, that you might propose? Great. Uh, Jim, do you want to take that one? I'm not sure that that is a regional challenge or task uh, versus a national or global one. Um, I think it's I think it's, it's changing by you know empirically. I think what what may have been lacking historically is sort of case studies and models of success and uh, examples for uh, for younger entrepreneurs to model themselves after. And 
and that is happening. You know, first of all, I think I think um, some female entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs may may be disadvantaged in some cases because uh, capital providers are pattern matching, uh, and it is an unfortunate truth of sort of human reality that in human behavior that people tend to be more comfortable with people who are more like themselves. And if the majority of capital providers are male, uh, they may be more reluctant to take the leap of faith that is required to uh, to give that capital to someone who is less like themselves. And, you know, I think people who maintain that perspective are going to be long-term losers uh, because they are ruling themselves out of great opportunities. I think you know these days where we reside, where a lot of value creation is sort of at the application layer, if you will, rather than the infrastructure layer. Uh, an understanding of customer behaviors, wants, needs, pain points uh, is critical to um, successful startup creation and, and, and growth. And, you know, we all probably recognize the majority of household dollars are controlled by email. Um, I teach, you know, in LA in particular, there are a lot of sort of back in the barrel uh, uh, successful startups, and I feel disadvantaged as a male investor. <laughs> Uh, uh, in, in those arenas. Um, so uh, I, I'm sort of answering your question without really answering the question. I think um, it'll happen through sheer force of will and through models of success that uh, aspiring entrepreneurs can follow. Sure. I'll, I'll, add, I'll add on to it real briefly. I'm, uh, uh, I'm chair of an organization called National Center for Women and Information Technology. Uh, we're, $10 million a year national organization as one of our major funders, a bunch of companies are as well. One of the things, we're focused on uh, generating uh, gender parity in, in uh, computer science and information technology uh, over the next, uh, next 20 years from when we started next decade or so from now. One of the weird areas we've studied very deeply and spent a lot of time on is entrepreneurship. We have an entrepreneurial alliance uh, for the woman who asked if you're interested in getting involved. I'd love to, I'd love to connect you in. Send an email to brad at feld.com. Uh, we've learned a number of things, and we believe really strongly in a couple of things. One is uh, the challenge is all pipeline related. It's uh, this issue that Jim described where women, uh, younger women especially, don't have role models. Uh, Ten years ago, if you'd asked uh, of you know, a, a high school girl or a high school boy who successful entrepreneurs in technology were, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 would be men, they described. Um, we started a program called Heroes. We've got interviews with over 100 uh, with female entrepreneurs. Um, just setting up that role model and making that accessible to younger women so that when they're in high school, when they're in college, they view being an entrepreneur as a logical path uh, creates a shift. Second is this notion of uh, playing a long game, right? We're seeing now huge amounts of energy and women helping other women, but also men helping other men in the context of entrepreneurship, having entrepreneurial education be democratized, having this notion of it being a male-centric financing environment changing. And what I'd encourage everybody is uh, whenever you do something like this, be aggressive about searching out the women in your community who engage in these kinds of events. We've got a panel that's all men, <laughs> right? Just try to, to put your mind shift into this notion of I'm looking for diversity uh, and diversity on gender and diversity on all other characteristics, including, by the way, education level, where you came from, uh, economic diversity, and trying to incorporate that into the startup community that you're building by being inclusive rather than defaulting to the people that are either comfortable, natural, or the ones that you are always defaulting to. Great. Thanks, Brad. I think we'll go to another question on the WebEx. Um, is it, I think, Giovanni Nkoba uh, is in Kigali, Rwanda. I think he's going to join. He's with the K-Lab Accelerator. Giovanni, are you there? Yeah, Giovanni? All right, we will go to a, are you there, Giovanni? Okay, we'll come back to Giovanni. Carrie, great. So uh, thank you to everyone. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, my name is Adam. I recently came back to Cleveland uh, to work on a tech startup. It's been really exciting. 
Uh, and I'm always, t I'm feeling this constant um, pull in two directions, where on one hand, it's been really great to come back to Cleveland. Uh, I really feel a sense of community here and belonging. But on the other hand, uh, there's this constant nudging in my head where in other cities there's a depth, uh, much deeper connections and understanding and experience that can help uh, me accelerate sort of my venture and uh, help me make what I, what I envision a reality. Um, so I was wondering sort of from all of your experience, what are the main reasons that entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs stay uh, in those communities and don't leave to you know the coasts or to other places. Thank you. Great question, Matthew. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, we've had to to compete with the the coast for talent uh, for quite some time. Uh, people typically look at Kansas City as being this cow town, this flyover country, and we've had to show people over time, hey, that's not the case. Uh, there's a lot of awesome startups here. There's a lot of some awesome entrepreneurs and a lot of awesome activity. Um, and so the real key is to uh, put in the framework so that they know, hey, I don't need to disappear to the coast to get the support that I need, to get the mentorship, the advisors. Um, it's all right here in my city. Um, and I think probably one of the biggest things we're competing with right now, you know, even in the Midwest to some degree, is the investment piece. And I don't know if that's something you struggle with, um, but I know with my own personal company, uh, it's, it, we kind of bang our heads against the wall sometimes because uh, on the coast, it seems as though investors there will invest into innovation and potential, whereas at least my experience uh, in the Midwest, they're investing in revenue, traction, the things that typical startups don't have yet, right? They're hoping to get there. Um, so I think each startup community battles with its own right. But Kansas City uh, has all of these pieces in play. I talked about One Million Cups. I there's a number of events and a number of organizations I could rattle off, but it's really up to all of those organizations to show, hey, the support is here. Don't run away. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be safe here. You'll be happy here. If I could just briefly add, you know, I think uh, one of the things that we all struggle with is, is the old notion that the grass was greener somewhere else. It's just different. I mean, that's what we've learned. It's different. And I would say, Adam, that one of the things that I always think about in my own particular situation when I think about the innovation work I've tried to engage in is that I can choose to be a small fish in a very big place like one of the West Coast environments, or I could try to be a much bigger fish in a much smaller pond here in the Midwest, here in Cleveland. And I've, I've dealt with that in my personal you know, sort of professional life for, for a very long time. Um, and I think that that's a personal trade-off. Um, and, and the idea that you'd be swimming with a lot of other uh, little fish I mean, you know, that's good because of what it represents. You could all get to the, you know, to the feeding place all at once, perhaps. But to distinguish and differentiate yourself, I, I think, again, we live with the illusion that somehow the grass is automatically greener, that there is a road to, you know, a, a golden place. All you have to do is get your, yourself on it. Um, so that's my two cents. Great. Last, last, com last comment on this one. I just want to add one thing. I have a deeply, deeply held belief uh, that you should choose where you want to live and then build your life around. Uh, I think that the illusion and the history of the organizational man, the 1940s and 50s and 60s and business in the 70s, where every year you move because IBM wanted you to move to another city and that was how you lived your life. Or even in the 1980s and 1990s and 2000s, sort of this notion that a particular geography really mattered. Um, we're rapidly in uh, a phase now where but geography matters in a very different way. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, somebody, uh, Jim is in LA. Giovanni, I don't know where you are, but you're, you know, <laughs> on the other side of the world. And, um, the, you know, we're at the beginnings of what will be a very radical uh, uh, dynamic around geography. And so for a younger person who's starting off on their career, if you want to live in Cleveland, and that's where you want to build your life, Build your life there. Do something really powerful and important. And don't get wrapped up in the idea that, oh, it'll just be so much easier if I go to the Bay Area. Exactly what was just said is going to be true. There's, the, there's always a demand imbalance, and it has everything to do with what you're driven by as an individual and where you want to live and what you want to do rather than, oh, everybody says I should go there because it's so much easier. It's just different. Great. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so, Giovanni, you're with us. Can you, uh, do you want to join in for a question? Can you hear us, Giovanni? Giovanni. 
Okay, uh, let's go to another local question, yeah. Uh, hi, you know what's interesting about this, uh, a few years ago, it, it, it would be all about technology and innovation and maybe money. And what's interesting about this conversation is this is a highly human discussion. Change of thinking, change of culture, change of mindset, long-term view. And my question is, is what do we need to do to sort of shift our thinking? And if there are ideas about how we have, more specifically, certain types of conversations around that shift of thinking. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Jim, you wanna take that one? I think that the, the subtle shift in the conversation away from uh, all, entirely being about money to being uh, about um, the sort of softer and more human element, uh, I think one is a very good thing, and, and two is, a, is in no small part a result of uh, the changes in the tech landscape. Uh, you know, where we're sitting today, when I, when I started uh, Rincon, I started it uh, because I saw, you know, this was before AWS launched, um, I saw that, that a set of companies with, with a particular set of characteristics could do more with less than ever before. And, you know, roll forward uh, uh, six, seven years, and uh, now we are at a time when a set of companies with a set of characteristics could do more with less than ever before. And next year it will be even better, and the year after that it will be even better. So I think the historical, um, uh, seemingly insurmountable barrier of, of lack of capital availability is getting shipped away by our own efforts, uh, by businesses that enable individuals to do more with less. Um, and so, so I think that is going to uh, continue to get better and better uh, and, and support uh, uh, distributed Great. Thanks, Jim. I know Love wanted to make a quick comment. Yeah, uh, Craig, I mean, my own observation is that uh, a decade or more ago, the conversation was among wizards and proud nerds. Um, and, and it was there necessarily a closed conversation. Uh, it's become a much more open conversation uh, because of things like Jim just mentioned, the idea that basically you can do a startup for literally, you know, a, t a tenth if not a twentieth of the, of the original cost, and you don't have to have a bench filled with wizards in order to pull the piece off. The other th part about open though, it's not an open conversation just because of the technology. I think we've opened the conversation, notwithstanding the fact that we have a long way to go when it comes to gender balance in our startup efforts. But I think about the power of the immigrant, uh, which again, 15 and 20 years ago was a closed conversation, not welcome. In the technology community, that's no longer even up for much discussion anywhere, including in this neighborhood. We need to keep the conversation open and invite all kinds of folks who've historically been outside the conversation and invite them in. Great, thanks, Lou. Uh, Giovanni, I'll try one more time. Yeah, can we hear you? Can you hear us? No. Okay. Why don't you let let us know what the question is? Okay, okay. Uh, Brad, I don't know if you could hear that, um, but basically, how do we convince, Brad, could you hear the question? No. No, uh, let me, look. hey Brad, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so basically just to restate, Giovanni um, texted a, a question basically around convincing folks that Rwanda um, could be an interesting opportunity for investors. Um, to deploy capital. Any, any comments? I know you're active in the Global Accelerator Network. Um, maybe you can sort of comment on what you're seeing in terms of sort of the globalization of capital um, and potentially sort of looking to places like Rwanda um, to, to invest there. Sure. I, I have no opinion specifically about Rwanda. I can't answer the direct question. Um, but I can, uh, I'll try to address it generally. Um, you know, the phenomena that is the notion of startups and entrepreneurship is not a U.S. phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. Um, it's one that because it's so easy to get access to information today, facilitated by the internet and, you know, contemporary technology around the world, um, not only can you understand what's going on, the ability to engage across geographic boundaries 
uh, is radically different. Um, you know, if you think about business and you think about government, start with government. Government is has arbitrary geographic boundaries. And many businesses have arbitrary geographic boundaries because of the arbitrary boundaries created by government uh, in different, you know, states and countries and cities. But the Internet doesn't care about any of that stuff. And as human beings, a lot of us, especially people who are entrepreneurs, don't care about that stuff that much. They care about finding other smart people, other interesting people who are trying to do amazing things. But if you separate between local business, business that's done in a geographic region, and global business, business that even for a small company is independent of any specific geography, all of a sudden you have a totally new vector of entrepreneurship. The education, the learning, the understanding, the mentoring, none of that has geographic constraints. And so it comes back down to the fundamental thing that a generation of entrepreneurs like Giovanni, presumably, over a long period of time will work to develop new and innovative things. Some of those will pop up to a level that's interesting from a global perspective. That will change the dynamics over time. Now, again, I don't know Rwanda specifically, so I'm not talking to that. But even if you just looked at European countries, from European country to European country, there's different dynamics. But the core activity that's happening that's changing what's going on is the same, which is that entrepreneurs are creating new things. They're taking a long view. They're communicating with each other. They're not treating it as a zero-sum game. They're being inclusive of engagement with each other, and they're changing the culture around innovation in their country, innovation in their community, around how business gets created, and they're leveraging this global information dynamic, which is enabled by the Internet, uh, to learn and to grow. Great. Thanks, Brad. I think we'll take the last question. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> So when we have like these kind of very high level events, uh, you know, it, it feels very good. We get a lot of support. We have a ton of turnout, and it's it's really awesome. But then uh, when I feel we get to more granular level, and we have a lot of the startups that are kind of have their backs against the wall. They need networking. They need help. They need money. They need people to step up. They need connections. They need sharing of knowledge. Uh, I feel like that, especially in Cleveland, almost never exists. So what are some of the things we could do to take this room full of people who are obviously very passionate about startups uh, on a very high level and get them down to that granular level where, you know, like people at this table who all have startups and most of our backs are against the wall, uh, you know, how can we turn this room into a room of network connections, a room of, you know, knowledge sharing, a room of, uh, you know, really help at that very granular, that very base level? Okay, great, great final question. Maybe what we'll do is we'll have every panelist kind of give a 30 second answer to that as sort of a way to wrap up. Jim, do you want to start? It, it suffered the very same issue. That there was no there there. There were lots of resources, but there was uh, uh, nothing, nothing marshalling those resources around a set of promising companies. And it, you know, they took a new kid in town, uh, 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 specifically Mark Suster, when he was brand new uh, in LA. Saw this and created a, a mentorship organization. Uh, one of the one of the participants called it a startup supper club. Uh, that was uh, the original uh, incarnation of Launchpad LA, which is now uh, a formal accelerator program. But literally, all it was was a was a series of of uh, of dinner get-togethers uh, where. Uh, you know, uh, as somebody described on this on this uh, uh, session already, where there'd be a little bit of show and tell, and and then some structured interaction around startups, the opportunities, what they're doing, and their challenges. Uh, and uh, now, you know, a number of other of those have sort of organically sprung up in the form of co-working spaces and formal accelerator programs. And now you're at a point in LA, in in Los Angeles, where there's probably a startup event every weeknight. Uh, and that's fantastic. Um, and it didn't happen overnight. It, it, it happened based on the initiative of an individual starting, and then another individual, and another individual, that, you know, starting simple with things like meetups. Great. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give Brad the last word, but let me do Matthew, and then Lev, and then Brad. I've got a good story behind this one. We talked about the role of government earlier uh, in the startup community. When the village was forming, 
Um, we had some commissioners who were interested, very passionate. How can we support this thing? How do we get behind it? And they were talking to one of the homes for hackers, hackers who came from Boston. Um, and they said, can we give you tax incentives? Can we give you tax credits, all this stuff? And he said, you know, honestly, I could use some burritos, <laughs> maybe a microwave, that would be pretty cool. Because it's those type of little simple things that can be so most supportive. So my answer to your question is two things. One, go do it yourself. Like create these groups, create these brands. That's what we did with the village. We didn't wait. And the great thing about doing that, again, Brad says entrepreneurs have to lead it. You don't have to answer to anybody. So when we created the village, people could try to tell us, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that. Thanks, good advice, but we probably won't do that because we didn't have to answer to anyone. Uh, and then I would also say uh, the One Million Cups program. I don't know how often everyone gets in the same room. I mean, this is fantastic. We do it uh, in Kansas City on a weekly basis, right? Everyone's in the room, everyone's communicating, and everyone's talking about how they can support one another. If you make it regular, it's only an hour, but if you make it regular, you'll see the conversation start to go uh, in new directions. Look. So don't ask for permission. I, that's, what I heard, that's what I heard there. Um, I do think that uh, there are all kinds of conversations underway. Uh, it's a matter of matchmaking. Uh, there are people in this room who should be finding you and your table if you're not already engaged in that tactical, practical, pragmatic kind of engagement opportunity uh, to offer insights, mentoring, uh, uh, business uh, development strategies, technology insights, and the like. And you know, I, I don't. And I started calling one set out. I, I'm going to forget uh, some some critic. But there's lots of people I recognize in this neighborhood who should find people in that neighborhood uh, to have some conversation immediately following it. And I think the last part of it in my own organization, uh, we we agree with the challenge, and so we are doing our best to put both our money where our mouth is and investing in in this ecosystem that's, uh, that's well underway here in Cleveland. Uh, and we will absolutely, uh, to the extent that we have the skills and the capabilities, uh, try to provide that kind of tactical, practical, pragmatic insight on the stuff that we know. And what we do know is a lot of other people here and ar around the world. And we're, uh, you know, that's part of our job is to obviously uh, continue to support and, and fertilize that Petri dish that we made a commitment to a decade ago. Great, thanks, Love. And Brad, the last word. Sure, well, uh, we'll end where we started. Uh, uh, and it's been said a couple of times already, entrepreneurs have to be the leaders. Um, it's not that you are waiting for anybody. It's that you just start. One of the four tenets of the Boulder thesis is that you have to have activities and events that engage the entire entrepreneurial stack on a continual basis. Those activities and events are driven by entrepreneurs. They don't cost any money to start. Uh, lots of the feeder organizations have resources for you, facilities that host you, they'll provide infrastructure for you, but you have to drive it. One of the mistakes I think a lot of people make historically is the entrepreneurs wait for something to happen or the people in the organizations that are the feeder organizations, again, university, government, investors, nonprofit supporting entrepreneurship, try to be the central hub of it. There is no president of your startup community. There is no vice president of membership or vice president of education. It's a chaotic network. It grows like a network. The best thing the entrepreneurs can do is focus on building that network through engaging with each other. The best way that the feeder organizations can engage with the startup community is to actually have members of those feeder organizations become nodes on the network. Uh, if you look at the startup community activity around the world in the vibrant places, you see story after story after story of, you know, 20 years of lots of people trying to organize and structure things and there being organizations. And then suddenly something that happens in LA, like Mark Suster, who was an entrepreneur and now a venture capitalist, who just started getting people together and doing stuff. But he didn't hog it. He didn't make it the Mark Suster show. He didn't make it about Mark. He made it about the LA startup community. And everybody that wanted to engage could, whether they were from LA. I'm from Boulder. When I go to LA, I'm always invited to events. I'm welcome to events. The events aren't about me. They're about the entrepreneurs and whatever's going on. So to the entrepreneurs in the audience, you're the leaders, just start doing. And I know that's hard to process when your back's against the wall and you're struggling with your company and you're wondering if you're gonna be in business or in a month, allocate 10% of your time to this 
and that 10% of that time should be selfish in the context of something that helps your company, but put it into your startup community in a way that helps you build your company and help perpetuate the startup community, and all the rest of the folks in the room recognize that those people need your help, offer how you can help, however you can help, and then go all in on. Great. Thanks, Brad. Well, with that, um, I want to thank um, Brad and Jim for joining via WebEx. It was great to have you join. Thanks to all the folks uh, also from around the world who joined via WebEx. Matthew and Lev, thanks for making it here. I think it's a great kickoff to the OBA Summit. It's a great kickoff to the Startups at the City Club series. Um, thanks to my colleagues at Case Western Reserve who provided all the WebEx and video equipment today and the City Club for hosting this. I think we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>